Testing, one, two. Yeah, let's, let's put it a bit higher up. Here we go. I'm a very quiet lad. I'm very quiet. <laughs> there we go. Good morning. Morning, everyone. Morning. Thank you so much, Martin and the band, for leading us in worship. It's such a powerful time uh, in God's presence. And I, I was really encouraged when Colin got up and said, uh, be still, because that was something I was sensing the Lord, the Lord say to me. And, and also remembering what we <laughs> It's always good to be still with the countdown video behind you. That was nice. <laughs> um, and actually, that, that does help, because it struck me the words from Oceans that Colin shared earlier. Actually, Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Help me walk upon the waters, wherever you would call me. And I was, I was sitting during worship thinking, actually, it's, it's far harder to lead someone that's kind of running around all over the place. It's far harder to lead someone that's frantic, kind of frayed, like kind of rushing here and there. Uh, and actually, just before I preach this morning, actually, I feel like God's laid it on my heart just kind of to back up what Colin said. Actually, we should just take a moment to be still. Uh, we, we, we spoke another moment to be still. We, we spoke about the shalom peace of God a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and it's just on my heart this morning that actually we would be those who just invite God's peace to rest on us, who invite his shalom peace to descend on us, that wholeness, that restoration of all things, that things, that, the peace that lacks nothing, that is bigger than our circumstances that defies logic even in the most difficult of situations. So can we just take a moment? I'm just going to say, be still and know that I am God a few times and just invite us to take a couple of moments of silence just to, to bring ourselves into the peace of God, into an awareness of his presence with us and into that still place so that he can lead us. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and no. Be still. Be. Loving Father, we thank you that we can be still and know that you are God. Thank you for that still, small voice that leads us, that speaks to us when we are still. Descend on us with your peace, with your shalom peace this morning. And guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, it's always such a privilege to share from God's Word. Uh, if we've not met, uh, you're really welcome here, especially if this is your first time. My name's Matt. I'm the curate here, uh, which is a vicar in training. Uh, and today we're kicking off our new two-part teaching series, which is really exciting, uh, all about the sacraments. The sacraments. A sacrament, you know, a word that I'm sure all of us use in daily life, you know. Oh, how are you? Yeah, no, I'm good, thanks. How was your weekend? Yeah, it's okay. Did you get out too much? Well, I partook in the sacraments. It was wonderful. <laughs> yeah, look, I'm sure all of us kind of have conversations like this in the workplace, or will do tomorrow morning. Uh, it's quite, quite a strange word, this word sacrament. So uh, this week we have the joy of focusing on baptism. Uh, we have the amazing uh, account of, from Matthew's Gospel of the baptism of Jesus. And then next week Malcolm's going to be sharing with us on communion. So baptism this week, communion next week. Uh, but it might be helpful, kind of just as we get going, to think, what do we mean when we talk of sacraments? What on earth does this word mean? Now, sacraments, depending on your church tradition, your background, your spirituality, are sometimes known as ordinances because they are visible signs that have been ordained by Jesus himself. They've been ordered, commanded, ordained. And actually, we remember that Jesus was baptized in the reading we've had this morning. Jesus was baptized. So why should we get baptized? Because Jesus was baptized. That's as good a reason as any. Sacraments are things that we've been commanded by Jesus to do. 
And I really find this definition helpful. Another way of thinking about sacraments is to think of them as outward signs of inward blessings. Outward signs of inward blessings, a means of grace, a means by which we encounter the grace of God. In other words, visible signs through which the blessings and grace of God are known. I had an email this week from Prime Movies. I'm sure some of you get Prime TV, you get these emails. Uh, and in this email it was saying, you know, new to Amazon Prime, Avatar, the way of water. Kind of like Aqua Smurfs. I don't know if anyone's, anyone's seen, seen Avatar. <laughs> but it, it struck me that actually in our reading, rather than the way of water, here we have Jesus, the way in water. The way in water, the way, the truth, the life. Not just a way, the way in water. And when we get baptized, we come to Jesus. We place our faith in who he is. We place our faith in his redeeming and saving power. And one thing that's really helped me over the years as I've kind of thought more about baptism uh, is to think of baptism more as an initiation rather than a graduation. Baptism is an initiation rather than a graduation. And I find this really helpful. And baptism is an initiation because when we're baptized, we are initiated into the new life that's on offer in Jesus Christ. Those of you who went to uni might have some interesting stories about initiations into particular societies. From, from memory at Exeter Uni, the, the hockey and rugby society initiations were especially brutal. <laughs> not, not ones to recommend. But when we're baptized, we're initiated into the new life that is on offer to us in Jesus. And furthermore, when we're baptized, we're initiated into the covenant family of God. I can see that really excites everyone this morning. <laughs> we're initiated into the covenant family of God. So it's like a double blessing, a double initiation. We're initiated into the new life on offer to us in Jesus Christ. And we're initiated into the fellowship of believers, the covenant family of God. And baptism is also an initiation because it tends to mark the beginning of our Christian journey. It tends to mark the beginning of our Christian journey. And it's important to say that baptism doesn't save us. Baptism is not a means of salvation. I've been asked before in Anglican churches, often in the baptism liturgy in the Church of England, we do this thing called the prayer over the water. Some of you might be familiar with the liturgy. And people have asked me before, why do we do that? Is it magic? Does it make the water kind of save people? Is it the most amazing bath that someone is about to have? But actually, baptism is not the means by which we're saved. Only Jesus can save. Jesus the way, not a way, the way. But even though baptism doesn't save us, it is a sign that we are saved. It's a sign of our salvation. It marks us as those who have decided to follow Jesus. As the song says, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow him. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. In baptism, we are identified with the death and resurrection of Jesus. Baptism symbolizes so much. One of the main things it symbolizes is dying to the former life, dying to our old life, dying to our sin, our shame, our guilt, all those things which have separated us from God and neighbor. And as we come up out of the water, we are brought into the new life that Christ has for us. And I'm so encouraged that baptism is not a graduation. I'm so encouraged that actually we don't have to have mastered the art of perfect holiness when we get baptized. Anyone here got everything figured out? Anyone here completely sanctified, completely holy, completely perfect? Give us a wave. No, there were one or two. I wondered if you'd, <laughs> if you'd stay. <laughs> Certainly plenty here more holy than me. But in baptism, we're not claiming to have it all figured out. We're not claiming to be the finished ticket, the finished article. In fact, I think often the opposite is true. Often when we get baptized, it comes in times of immense difficulty and struggle. 
Life is not necessarily a bed of roses. And by the way, let's be wary of any gospel that's preached that promises that following Jesus is all easy peasy. <laughs> load of rubbish. So we identify with Christ's suffering. We identify with his death. We identify with his wounds. And his wounds minister to ours. Him, the wounded healer, ministering to our wounds. His scars speaking to us. The Christian life is not easy. And I want to say sorry if you've ever been in a church where that's what's been promised to you. I'll give your life to Jesus, follow Jesus. Everything will be fine from that point on. It's actually Jesus himself, one of the, in some ways, the most frustrating promises in the Bible where Jesus says in John, in this world you will have trouble. Oh, really, Jesus? Can we maybe just not have trouble? <laughs> actually, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. When we get baptized, we identify with the one who has overcome. The one whose death and resurrection means that he has already secured the victory. That it is finished. He has done it. Death, where is your sting? Amazing. And it's this that we get baptized into. I'd love us just to turn to scripture. If you have a Bible uh, with you, uh, I've got one here on my phone. Apparently, it is also available as a book now as well. So um, <laughs> if you do take out, take out your church Bible, and if you turn with me to Acts 16, uh, this wonderful uh, account of the conversion of the Philippian jailer. I love this story. So Acts 16, verse 25. I'm just going to read these verses to us. This is 25 to 34, Acts 16. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Also, just as an aside, as a running piece of Bible commentary, notice how things happen on the back of prayer and worship in this passage. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a violent, such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up. And when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Amazing story. Dramatic conversion of the Philippian jailer. His journey to baptism, those of you who've already been baptized, I don't know what your journey to baptism looked like. I don't know how you ended up coming to that point. But the Philippian jailer's journey was incredibly dramatic. In a moment, he goes from choosing to draw his own sword to end his own life, thinking that the prisoners had escaped, thinking that he'd failed to do his job properly, to then suddenly being baptized, he and all his family, then even tending to Paul and Silas's wounds and giving them a meal, hosting them. What an incredible transformation. Now, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that the Philippian jailer, in similar circumstances, might have encountered a few roadblocks in some churches today. If he'd asked to be baptized uh, in a number of churches today, he probably would have been encouraged to do a baptism course. Probably would have been signposted to some relevant support agencies to help with his suicidal tendencies. And then he'd have been encouraged to do Alpha, perhaps, before becoming a fully committed tithing member of the church. And then maybe he'd have been able to be baptized. It's such a challenge for us in the church here. This isn't the case here. The Philippian jailer goes from contemplating suicide, nearly taking his life, to consecrating himself to God, and finding his life in a matter of minutes. From the drawn sword 
to the Saviour whose love draws all people to himself. Amazing. Now, all of that is by way of introduction, but I promise we will be home by Tuesday, so do, <laughs> do stay with me. Uh, briefly this morning, I want to share three things that happen uh, when we are baptised. I'm deliberately not really going to go into the kind of believers' baptism, infant baptism kind of conversation this morning. We are a church that offers both adult baptism and infant baptism, and I appreciate that even in the room there'll be a range of views around that. But if you want to talk more about that to me afterwards, I'm really happy to. But I just want to share briefly three things that happen uh, when we are baptised. And conveniently, these words all begin with C, which incidentally is a great place to do baptisms. I don't know where the nearest C would be to here, maybe South End or Frinton, um, not sure, but uh, I've, I've in the past seen and uh, witnessed baptisms in the sea, and it's, it's incredibly special, and it feels quite biblical. <laughs> so the first word that I want us to think about this morning is cleansed. Cleansed. When we are baptized, we are cleansed. The waters of baptism wash over us as a sign that we are those who are cleansed and washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. Baptism cleanses us from all those wrong thoughts, wrong choices, wrong decisions, wrong actions, wrong words that we have done, that we've chosen to turn away from and turn to God. And I'm sure you know this, but in the Greek, the word for repent is metanoia. And that literally means a literal turning around, a turning away from. Here are all the wrong things that we've done, all the wrong things in our life. And when we come to Jesus, we turn away from those things and we walk to Jesus, who happens to look like the person Martin had <laughs> this morning in, in my highlight. Um, when we are baptised, we are cleansed. Baptised Christians are repentant sinners who know that they need to confess their sins and who recognise their ongoing need to be cleansed and washed by the sinless Saviour who loves them and who gave himself for them. We're not saying when you get baptised that you'll never need to be cleansed again. I'll ask again, has anyone perfected perfect holiness? <laughs> but baptism is a cleansing. It's a cleansing. And the second thing that happens when we're baptised, the second of our C words is claimed. We are claimed by God at the moment of baptism. So we are cleansed and then we are claimed. If you've been part of the Anglican Church... And I know there's several die-hard fanatical Anglicans in the room. Uh, that was said slightly ironically, just to clarify. Um, if you've been part of the Anglican Church for a little while, then you will be familiar with uh, some of the baptism liturgy that the Church of England uses at baptisms. And we actually have a baptism next Sunday morning at the 8.45, which is, is really exciting. And uh, Malcolm seems to think is the first baptism in the 8.45's history, potentially, uh, here, which is, is doubly exciting. But in the baptism liturgy, and we'll use this next Sunday, you'll hear the following words, and these are spoken to the baptism candidate or candidates uh, in the moments leading up to the actual baptism itself. So these are the words. Christ claims you for his own. Receive the sign of the cross. Christ claims you for his own. Christ claims you. He doesn't just associate with you. He doesn't just occasionally speak to you on a Sunday. He claims you. You belong to to Christ. Christ belongs to you. Beautiful words to mark a beautiful occasion. If you've been baptised, then you have been claimed by Christ. You belong to him. You don't belong to anyone or anything else. You belong to Christ. Praise God. Now, as I was thinking about this idea of being claimed by God, I felt God remind me of the baggage reclaim area at an airport. Uh, and I sensed him actually saying to each of us, he'd say that Christ died to claim you. And that his death and resurrection and his life are far bigger than all the baggage that you might come to him with. Christ has claimed you and his love will go on fighting and fighting and fighting for you. He'll keep on reclaiming you again and again and again. Similarly to how we're cleansed and they need to be cleansed again. We're claimed and God longs to remind us that we are his. We belong to his. He reclaims us again and again and again. When we wander, we'll get lost. Every night I whisper this prayer over my children when I put them to bed. May you know that Christ is for you. 
and not against you. That Christ is with you. Christ claims you for his own. And in our reading from Matthew 3, so incredible seeing the affirmation and delight of the Father over the Son. And for us, when we're baptized, we're reminded, like Jesus, of our true God-given identity. There's such a battle for our identity. And yet in baptism, we remind ourselves and those who witness that sacrament, this outward sign of an inner blessing, that we are loved by God, that we've been claimed by him. I love the verses in Matthew 3. Uh, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is my daughter who I love. All the ladies here this morning. With you, God is well pleased. God delights in you. Zechariah 3, 17. He delights in you. He rejoices over you as singing. Amazing. God delights in us. God claims us. He goes on claiming us. And the world, the flesh, the devil, they all want to claim you as their own. The world wants to claim you into its society of live for self, be the master of your own destiny, be your own boss. Salvation comes from within. Be anything you want to be. Jesus stands with you in the water saying, you belong to me. You are my beloved son. You're my beloved daughter. With you, I am well pleased. Do you want to know who you are? Do you want to know whose you are? Then get baptized. If you haven't already been baptized, get baptized. So in baptism, we are cleansed, we are claimed, and finally we are commissioned. We are commissioned. I've already said that one of the things that happens when we're baptized is that we're adopted into the covenant family of God. And this word commissioned, uh, dictionary definition of this word means that you are officially or formally appointed. And this just filled me with so much joy this week. You are officially appointed as beloved sons and daughters of God. Praise God. Give us a wave if you've been officially appointed as a beloved son or daughter of God. Great, about three of us. That's brilliant. (laughs) If you've been baptized, you have been commissioned. You've been officially appointed and recognized as a beloved child of God. And this fellowship, this family that we come into, it's not small. (laughs) It's local. It's regional. It's national. It's global. This family of God, this fellowship of believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, the whole world over. As well as being commissioned into the family of God, as I said earlier, you are commissioned into the new life that Christ has for you. You're commissioned into choosing to follow him wholeheartedly, to live for him wholeheartedly. As I've alluded to already, I want to say that this commissioning is not without cost. This commissioning does not come without a cost. It costs Jesus everything. It costs Jesus everything. And as we remember, as we're mindful of our brothers and sisters in the persecuted church, those who don't enjoy anywhere near the same kind of freedoms that we have, to meet, to worship, to pray, those for whom baptism is a very literal matter of life and death, not just a symbolic one, we're reminded that actually baptism, following Jesus, Coming to Christ comes at a great cost. Perhaps one of the most famous movie strap lines. Here's a little quiz. Let's try this. Uh, I don't know. I haven't got a prize, but we'll find a prize later for someone. Uh, one of the most famous movie strap lines is just when he thought it was safe to go back in the water. Can anyone tell me what film that's from? Heard Jaws. It's not quite right. It's nearly right. Jaws 2. Jaws 2. There we go. Jaws 2. <laughs> It was too. Just when he thought it was safe to go back in the water. 
Baptism is not safe. Baptism is not cozy or comfortable. It's a public decision to follow Jesus, to identify with Christ's death. But baptism is wonderful. Baptism is a sign of the saving grace and love of God. And when we are baptized, the other thing we are commissioned into is the salvation plan of God. Pete Hughes, who leads KFC Church in London, uh, helpfully kind of sums up the whole story of Scripture by saying that it's about creation, decreation, and recreation. A journey from creation all the way through to recreation. And baptism symbolizes this recreation. We are commissioned into the salvation plan of God. We, fallen sinners, who are in desperate need of God, in desperate need of his kindness, his love, and his grace are recreated and made new in the waters of baptism. And there's lots of things in reality that we're commissioned into. And there's probably lots of other words beginning with C that we could have used and some that we definitely shouldn't use. But one of the things that I want to say this morning, I feel the Lord laid on my heart, is actually that we are commissioned into joy. When we are baptized, we are commissioned into joy. Anyone here need a bit more joy in their life? (laughs) It's amazing. We're commissioned into joy. Imagine the joy that Jesus felt at the moment of his baptism. The Spirit of God descending on him like a dove. A voice from heaven coming, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Just imagine if the next time you had a shower, the heavens opened. And the Spirit descended on you or on your hair net. And you heard the voice of God. This is my beloved daughter. This is my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Amazing. I was reminded in my preparation as well that joy is one of the fruit of the Spirit. So actually when we're baptised... We should expect the Spirit to encounter us. We should expect the Spirit to descend on us. Something I would always encourage anyone that wants to get baptized to do is actually to go into that moment incredibly full of expectation. And I'm sure many of us here will be able to share stories and testimonies from our own baptisms where we sensed we had a powerful encounter with the Spirit of God, with the presence of God, with the love of God. Such a deep privilege to be baptized. Such a deep privilege to come to the way in the water. In a moment, I'm going to pray, and I want to pray specifically uh, for those of us uh, who feel like we need it to be commissioned into that joy. I believe that God wants to release joy in this place. There's joy in the house of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is your strength. One of the biggest sadnesses when you look at the church sometimes, is that Christians seem like the most miserable people on the planet. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you should have saved me before I got saved. (laughs) (laughs) Apologies to any brummies (laughs) in the the room. We should be amongst the most joyful people around. And it's not some kind of contrived joy. It's not kind of joy which means we're naive or ignore or just gloss over or bottle up the difficult things that are going on. It's a joy that triumphs over circumstance. It's like the peace of God that we prayed for earlier. The peace of God which passes all understanding. I can think of so many times in my life where I've been in moments where the last thing I'm feeling is peaceful. The last thing I want is for someone to pray for me. And the last thing I want is to really know the peace of God. And yet the peace of God comes to us, guards our hearts and our minds. Fills us, protects us, sustains us, lifts our gaze away from our own navels and to the beauty of God in Christ. It's the same with God's joy. We've been commissioned into this amazing joy, the joy of the Lord that is our strength. So often we come to God, we come to church on Sundays feeling weak, feeling broken. I want to say that's a good place to be. The Lord is close to the broken heart. 
the bruised reed he will not break. I really believe that there are some here today that are desperate for the joy of the Lord. As we desperately long to know the joy of the Lord. We know that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And that's one of the amazing hopes of baptism, that when we get baptized, when we step into the water, we are commissioned into, we step into the unfailing, unbreakable promises of God. There's a reading from 1 Peter at the 8.45 this morning, reminding us of our inheritance that will never rust or perish. We come into that inheritance. We come into the treasure in heaven stored for us when we get baptized. Irrespective of our circumstances. So I'd love to invite the band uh, to come back up and we're going to continue to worship. And I'd also uh, love to encourage everyone to make use of, of the opportunity to receive prayer at the end of our service. Our prayer ministry team will be over here on my right, your left. If you'd like prayer for anything that's stirred what I've been sharing or for anything else, no matter how big or small you feel it is, then do please uh, take the opportunity to come and, and receive prayer and be prayed for. Uh, I'd love us to stand if that's okay. Can I invite us to stand? And as I said earlier, if, if you've got questions around baptism, if you, if you have not yet been baptized and would like to get baptized, then Malcolm and I are always up for getting our swim shorts on and baptizing people. <laughs> So if you'd like to be baptized, then please do speak to me. We would love to make that happen. Also, you're coming into a good time of year to get baptized. The weather's hopefully getting a bit warmer. Um, one of the first things I did, actually, when I came to St. Mary's was baptize, uh, help to baptize a few people. And they're here in this room this morning. And it was such, such a privilege to do that. It's always such a joy. Uh, it's so beautiful to see people coming to Christ, coming into the hope of baptism, knowing that they are cleansed, that they're claimed, that they're commissioned by God. So there's three things I want to pray into this morning, uh, and it's around those three words. So maybe just as I pray, as I pray for us, maybe if you're comfortable, maybe we just bow our heads and put our hands out just as a, as a sign that we want to receive what God has for us, as a sign that we want to do business with God and encounter God. And the first thing I want to pray for is that we would be those who know they are cleansed by God. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, pour out your forgiveness, your mercy, your kindness on us repentant sinners. Lord, where we've done wrong, where we've thought wrong, where we've said wrong, we are sorry and repent. We turn away from those things and we turn to Christ. The way, the truth, and the life. Let your streams of living water wash over us. Come and cleanse us. Lord Jesus. So I want to pray for anyone here struggling with their identity. Feeling pulled between a million different pillars and posts, feeling overwhelmed. Father God, I pray that you would remind each of us here who we are in Christ. Remind us whose we are, Lord God. Remind us that we belong to Jesus. That our life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ our Savior and our God. Lord, where we disqualify ourselves, where we discount ourselves, where we're so overwhelmed and so aware of all our own shortcomings, our brokenness, our failings, our struggles, our anxieties. Lord, would you speak that voice, that words of affirmation over us. You are my beloved daughter and son. With you, I am well pleased. May we know that we belong to you and that we've been claimed by you, Lord Jesus. And finally, Lord God, I want to pray for an outpouring of joy in this place. Holy Spirit, come, release joy in this place. Pour out your joy on us. May the joy of the Lord 
be our strength. Lord, where we've grown numb, where we've grown weary, where we've grown hard-hearted, break through, Lord, with your joy. Release laughter, release lightness, lift off the burdens that weigh us down, the things that overwhelm us. Bring your joy. You call us into joy, not despair. You call us into hope, not hopelessness. Come, Holy Spirit, release your joy and help us to trust you. Help us to look to you. Help us to live our lives for you, wholeheartedly. With you, the way, the truth, and the life, who shows us the way to live, who stands with us in the waters of baptism. Come and lead us, we pray. We worship you. And we love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's worship you. Uh, and while they're worshiping, don't forget to go and get your children from their various groups. Thank you, man. Stay.